Good afternoon. The flowers have arrived, so we can get started now. I'm Marjorie Hassan, director of the Bowdoin College Library, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's program celebrating the library's acquisition of the Esther Kramer Collection of American Cookery. Today's lecture and the opening of the exhibit that will follow recognizes Esther's generous gift, which enabled the acquisition of this extraordinary treasure trove and her keen eye and imagination, which led her to recognize its potential value to the Bowdoin community. More than simply providing a historical overview of American culinary arts, the collection's 700 volumes serve as a remarkably rich resource for the study of cultural and social history over a 150-year period. In the brief time that the collection has resided in the library's George J. Mitchell Department of Special Collections and Archives, it has attracted the interest of numerous students and faculty and has already become woven into the fabric of the library's mission to support teaching and learning on the Bowdoin campus. It is thanks to ESTA that, the current, and, that current and future students and faculty will have the opportunity to work with this valuable primary source research material. Esther's been a friend to Bowdoin for many years. She and her late husband, the influential art critic Hilton Kramer, met when both worked for Arts Magazine in New York in the early 1960s. They vacationed in Maine throughout their lives together, eventually returning to Damariscotta in two, retiring sorry, to Damariscotta in 2002. Around that same time, Hilton donated his papers to the library's Department of Special Collections. Thus began a relationship with the college, the library, and the Museum of Art, which continues to draw Esther to campus and to our students, faculty, and staff. I've had the opportunity to get to know Esther over the past months and have learned <clears throat> that her wide-ranging interests include art, music, gardening, and cooking. It was her passion for food, cooking, and cookbooks that led her to Don Lindgren and Rabelais books, and eventually to the acquisition of this outstanding collection which she is pleased to know will reside on the shelves of the Bowdoin Library along with Hilton's papers. Esther, on behalf of the college and the library, please accept my thanks for your generosity and enthusiasm. You had a wonderful idea and you made it happen. Thank you. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Don Lindgren. Don is an antiquarian bookseller specializing in books on food, drink, and their enjoyment. A graduate of the University of Chicago, he began his bookselling career in 1979, initially specializing in 20th century arts and letters. In 2006 in Portland, Don opened Rabelais, Fine Books on Food and Drink, which several years ago moved to a space in Biddeford's North Dam Mill. To describe Rabelais simply as a bookstore that sells books, manuscripts, and ephemera related to culinary history and culture does not do it justice. It has, in fact, been called a national treasure, and in Bon Appetit magazine, the best cookbook shop in America. Clearly, these accolades refer to Don's deep knowledge and expertise in the world of culinary history and the reputation he has earned among his colleagues. Don counts among his professional activities, serving as governor of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America and as a frequent speaker on topics related to cookbooks and cookery. This fall, he spoke at Boston University as part of its programs in food and wine Jacques Pepin lecture series. And in March, he will give a lecture at the University of Southern Maine in conjunction with the recently opened exhibit, Sustenance in Artist Books. I had the pleasure of hearing Don speak last spring when he hosted the Baxter Society, the Bibliophilic Club of Portland, at his shop in Biddeford. That was also the first opportunity I had to see what is now known as the Esther Kramer Collection, a very discerning and carefully assembled opus gathered by Clifford Apgar, a collector and cookbook enthusiast, over a period of many years, each item selected for its historical significance. As Don carefully removed one title after another from the shelf, simultaneously describing what was unique or compelling about each item, his excitement was palpable, his enthusiasm contagious, and the breadth of his knowledge remarkable. I'm delighted that Don could join us today to celebrate the placement of this collection at Bowdoin and to speak about the anatomy of a cookbook. 
So please join me in welcoming Don Lindgren. Thank you very much. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, thank you to Bowdoin, Co Bowdoin College, um, to the folks at the library in particular, and of course to Esther Kramer. Um, without Esther's involvement, um, it's, this would have been a collection looking for a home, and it found the most marvelous home, and that it's proving to be the most marvelous home uh, because of the way it's being, the collection's being used. So what I'd like to do uh, today is to introduce you to some of the different ways we have of thinking about historical cookbooks. They apply to uh, modern cookbooks as well. Um, and the first is to just think about the, the cookbook as a useful object. I use this in the, in the title, The Useful Object and Its Users, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, cookbooks are familiar to all of us. We cook with them, some of us, most of us, I hope. We refer to them for inspiration, when we don't know what's for dinner, for clarification, when we don't remember how much, how long, or how hot, we refer to them to remind us of a very fine dinner in a nice restaurant or on a fa very favored vacation. We give them as gifts. We give them when a child goes off to school or a young couple gets married or a friend buys a first home. And we recall a mother or granddaughter through a battered and food-stained copy of her favorite book, which contains our favorite recipe for a cookie or a cake. These are just a few of the ways that cookbooks are useful to us as the reader or the cook. But beyond this, there are all sorts of other people involved. Um, and the cookbook has different uses for each of these people and, for, and tells different stories at various points in the cookbook's life. Since we're here to honor the Bowdoin's acquisition of the Esther Kramer collection, we'll be looking at historical books mostly from the collection, but I hope you'll see how the historical examples I talk about have contemporary relevance and perhaps uh, within your own cookbook collections. So I say useful object. Why not useful text? This is a single uh, or a pair of shelves from the, uh, the collection when it was at uh, housed at Rabelais for about a year while we took time to uh, uh, research and catalog the collection. You can see that these books are all different shapes and sizes. You can see that there's uh, different types of designs used. If you were to look very closely, you'd start to see that they have very different subject matter. There are general cookbooks. There are household books. There are books that contain uh, recipes beyond household. Um, there are uh, nutritional books, economic books, single subject books on just baking or just on eggs. But this is a single decade. Um, the little white card on the left that sticks out of the shelf tells us that this is the 1860s, and, or sorry, this is the 1870s. And um, in this decade, the physical notion of what we could see on this shelf was enough to tell us a lot about what was going on in America, but also what was going on with cookbooks and how much they had changed over the decades prior to this. So we're going to look at a few examples of things just real quickly. These are two examples of Mary Randolph's Virginia cookbook. Both of these are in the collection, and at least one of them is on exhibit upstairs, or sorry, on the second floor of the library. Um, the one on the left is the original edition, the first edition of 1824, and the one on the left was issued in 1831. They're slightly different physically, but what's really remarkable about, about them is that in the second uh, version of 1831, the title has now changed to include the Virginia housewife or methodical cook, method is the soul of management. <laughs> and this is a super important book. It's, it's, for some people who, who look at uh, early American cookery, this is the most important cookbook. I'm not sure I completely agree, but uh, it's certainly a very, very important book. It's the first regional book published in America. It's the first Southern American cookbook. And for some, it's arguably the first book of American cuisine. And so what do we mean when we talk about American cuisine? Well, we talk about recipes that are explicitly American, not just ingredients that are explicitly American, but recipes. And so you start to see things that really, they have, uh, they have origins elsewhere, but this is the first time that you see them in printed form like gumbo. 
by, this, by the, the later edition, the one on the right-hand side, where they start to talk about this book as methodical. Um, you're looking at something that had crept into the American vocabulary of cookbooks in the, the brief seven years between the two publications. This is a much later book, and uh, Montpelier, Vermont, Rules for Cooking by the Lady Society of the Church of the Messiah, uh, 1894. So this is a later edition, it's 1894 publication, uh, the second edition. The first edition is unknown. There's only one known copy of this book besides the copy that is in the uh, Kramer collection here at Bowdoin, and uh, there are no known copies of the first edition of the book. This is a type of book that we see a lot in the later half of the of the 19th century following the Civil War. It's a charitable church or community book. And those three words get used interchangeably a lot, um, but I would just like to point out that this is a very specific group of people assembling recipes locally, and usually with the purpose of raising money for a church or some charitable uh, uh, activity. Often these came out of the Civil War where they were trying to raise money for soldiers returning home, um, after they realized how effective they were at raising money, they started using these as fundraisers for all sorts of purposes, including building a new church, putting on a new addition. Uh, um, they, they were used to raise money for suffragettes. They were used to raise money for all sorts of social causes. So one of the things we're going to be seeing a little bit later on is how the the book beyond the text itself starts to speak to us through the use of the, uh, of the cook at home, through the use of wh whoever was using it. This is an example of a book that's well stained and the index has been remarked upon uh, in terms of what has been cooked in this household and what the people thought of what, what was cooked. So the first book I want to talk about in particular is a book that's on, that is on exhibit uh, at the library right now. And this is probably the, the single rarest and most sought after book in the collection if you were to think about um, the, the market out there. Um, and this is the only book we're going to talk about the market with at all. But this is Robert Roberts, The House Servants Directory, Boston, 1828. This is an exceptionally important book for a number of reasons. Um, this is the first book of household management written by an African-American, and it's widely understood to be the first book published by a mainstream publisher in America that was authored by an African-American in any field. There are certainly uh, books by African-Americans that appear in the U.S. before that, but most of them were published overseas. Um, this one was the first one published here in the United States. And one of the reasons that this book is so sought after is because it is uh, a very important piece of African Americana in addition to being a very important book of household servant uh, um, directions. Robert Roberts was extremely well regarded. He was a Boston uh, household servant. He worked for the Gore family, which is the family we think of as the, the, um, the family Al Gore is descended from. Um, and he was considered such an expert in his field that he was sought after to write this book. So now we're going to get to the actual anatomy and start talking about some specifics. The first thing you want to think about when you think about a cookbook is the recipe. It's what drives us to the books. It's what really why, what, why most of us buy the books. There's something in the book we would like to cook. So it's sort of the, the basic unit of any cookbook is the recipe. There are parts of those units, just like there are atoms, neutrons, and protons, and even smaller, smaller particles that make up um, uh, neutrons, protons, and electrons that make up atoms, um, the basic unit which you, you have to have to have a cookbook is recipes. So this is a single manuscript rec recipe. This is not part of the collection. It's a single sheet. But this illustrates a couple of points really nicely. The first is this word receipt, which is interchangeable with the word recipe. Um, and that's because they all come from the same root, which is recipere or recipio. Um, which is a Latin word means, which means, depending on how it's inflected, to receive or to take. So it's basically when you start a receipt, you're saying, take this. And you see the little RX sign in the upper left-hand side. We're familiar with that from pharmacies. But the, the, the RX actually stands for receipt or take. So the recipe starts with take 24 pounds of black cherries, blah, blah, blah. 
You could say, if you were a pharmacist, take three aspirin and call me in the morning, or if you're a doctor prescribing. We're familiar with that. That is the, uh, it's sort of the foundational unit of the recipe is the, this idea of taking these ingredients and gathering them together. Um, so each recipe that we look at, whatever form it is, whether it's an ancient book, uh, a historical book from the 18th century, or a modern cookbook, has a, usually a name for the recipe, a list of ingredients, or a set of ingredients, and then a set of instructions or steps. And this has them all, but the ingredients are integrated into the text. This is a narrative recipe, it's a type of recipe um, which is how recipes started out. It was only much later that you see recipes that break things out the way we're used to now, where you have um, the name, a separate list of ingredients, and then a separate list of steps or instructions. And this is the book, also from the collection, which is the first book that does it throughout the entire book, where they break the pieces up and have the, the instructions of a recipe separate from the ingredients, separate from the title. This is um, Eliza Leslie's 75 Receipts, originally published in 1828. Um, she is the first person to have done this. This is her second book, and every recipe throughout the book has it's separated out like this, and occasionally there's even a little extra sentence, which is something we're very used to in modern books. It says, like, this is delicious on a hot summer day. <laughs> so this book is looked at as, the, as a, a really great advancement in the history of recipe writing. And so one could look at this and say that this was the moment when the progress occurred in this, in this format of recipes. But the reality is that the book was published a number of times, these are three different editions of the book, all which are part of the Kramer collection. Uh, the one on the left is the 1828, the one in the middle is 1831, and the one on the right is 1875. And you can see that there are some slight changes in the format. These slight changes reflect the way, you know, different ways of marketing books, different types of, of uh, binding uh, design that was available in the, in the 1840s that wasn't available in the 1820s. But the real change is that she dropped the recipe format. She went back to the narrative form. And it, she, she was the author of about six other books, or six other cookbooks. None of those books use the specific broken out recipe form. In the, her original book, which did do that, she says specifically, that she was trying to make these recipes intelligent to servants, intelligible to servants and persons of the most moderate capacity, <laughs> which is more than a mild diss of, of her intended readers. So <laughs> you have to wonder exactly what happened between, 18, uh, between the original and, the, and the, the one from the 1840s and with her later books. And, and I, I don't think we have an answer to that. It's just a sort of a clue for an interesting study. But you do, I think that the, probably the greatest chance is that there's a, uh, um, she has decided that her audience has changed. So this is a modern recipe. This is from Fergus Henderson's uh, uh, Nose to Tail, Beyond Nose to Tail Cooking. It's an English cookbook from the early 2000s. Um, it's, it's widely considered a, a sort of a masterpiece of a cookbook. But the reason I show this is because I want to show that the recipe here is in that original narrative form. So this idea that there might be development of recipe format or development or progress within recipe format is not necessarily, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily bear out. And that's because there's a different audience for every recipe. The author has an in, a different intended audience and the, the books are marketed at different people, obviously, by the publishers and booksellers. So this recipe is specific for a certain audience that he was trying to reach. And he did a good job of it because it was, this book was just nominated for sort of greatest modern cookbook um, by a group of a thousand different chefs worldwide. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about ingredients within the recipes. Um, you, you don't have to be able to read this, don't worry about it. This is, a, this is a little map of ingredients that I had to do as part of a class I took, and I know that there are at least one or two people in the audience who, who took this seminar as well. Um, this was Barbara Wheaton's uh, historical uh, cookbook seminar that she gives each year at 
uh, the Schlesinger Library at Harvard, and uh, was for me was a really sort of seminal moment in terms of understanding cookbooks. She asked us each to take a different book and to write down a list of every single ingredient that we found in the book. This was just one day's activity. And I happen to have, have a, a uh, much later facsimile edition of a 15th century English manuscript. So I just sat there going through page by page and wrote out every single ingredient I could find. And then she asked us to sort of group them together by ingredients that, that belong together. So if you were to look at the, just right in the very center, you see borage and uh, tansy and hyssop and some other things I can't read. Um, uh, just to the, like, four o'clock to that, it's leeks, beets, peas, and whatnot. Each one of these things comes, the, these things are grouped together because they come from a different place. So the, the borage and the tansy come from the herb garden, and the leeks and the beets and the peas come from the sort of general vegetable garden. And if you were to go to the very bottom on the right-hand side, you have eel and tench, which is a kind of carp and ray and sturgeon, and you have all the seafood. And you could then break that up and talk about what comes from the lake and what comes from the stream and what comes from the sea and what comes from the tidal areas like oysters. Um, and so you could go on and on with this and eventually have a map of where all the food comes from in this cookbook. And that would then give you another whole uh, set of information, or at least a big clue for that information, which is how many people did it take to gather this stuff? Like, if you've got people that are getting lobsters and eels and whelks and porpoise and freshwater fish, and then all the game from the woods, and they're trapping rabbits, and you know somebody else is making butter and brawn and oatmeal. So you have all of these activities that go into making the ingredients that are used in this book. And it gives you a really good sense of how, how big an operation it is and how wealthy the people are. So simply by taking this list of ingredients and thinking about it and knowing nothing else, having no external sources, one could start to draw some general conclusions about what kind of book we were looking at. Who was the intended audience? How many people were eating? How many people were in the service? of the people who were eating? And that was really the key. With this particular book, it was clearly a royal manuscript these people were at the very, very top of the food chain, and they were eating whatever they wanted. <laughs> it's also worth noting this is a 15th century English book, and there are ingredients on this list that come from as far away as India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Madagascar. So I want to get beyond just the recipe and talk a bit about the author and intention, because it's when we look at the authors, and we think we, we have to look really closely at the books to figure out what the author's intentions are. Um, and sometimes they're lying. Um, this one they're not. This is, this is a little preface that, in, that was included in a, uh, in, in a charitable book, the People's Receipt book, uh, which was from upstate New York in the 1880s. And the nice thing about this is this describes everything that they intended to do when they published this book. They, they talk about how the purpose is to raise money for the church, to give some visibility to their advertisers, because almost all of these church and community books contained adver advertisements for people within the church community. Um, and they wanted to provide tasty things that you could serve at home. And that's basically, you know, in a nutshell, the three uh, things that almost every church, charitable, and community book are looking to do. It's a, the big question is like, who, who are they raising the money for? Is it a church or is it a charitable thing? So right here, you get a pretty nice explanation. Here's another one, but this one is actually really fun. This is the dust jacket flap. It's one of the rarest dust jacket flaps, or dust jackets in all of cookbook collecting for the original self-published first edition of Irma Rombauer's Joy of Cooking. Um, I'm, I, I feel bad that I'm not showing you the front of the book because it's one of the most beautiful uh, dust jackets produced of, in any category. And this, there are probably only about a half a dozen known copies of this dust jacket. There's no copy of the dust jacket in any institutional collection that I'm aware of, um, including you know, in, in the, the Kramer collection here, although there is a lovely uh, first edition of the book. But the reason that, the, that something as 
as ephemeral as a dust jacket is important is because this is the author's statement. This is a self-published book. Irma Rombauer wrote everything that had to do with this book. There was no publisher mediating her ideas here. And she lays out everything she wants to say about why she, she's doing the book. Every effort has been made to add variety and interest to everyday fare, as well as to provide dishes for special occasions. Hundreds of tested recipes. She's got to point out the recipes are tested. Uh, they're both old and new. Uh, experienced cooks will find novelty, and, and beginner cooks will find fail-safe recipes. And then this, this almost closing line that I love, the zeitgeist is reflected in the chapter on leftovers. But this text, which is the author's statement about why she wrote the book. Now, her, her story is obviously much more complicated and much longer than this. This is just, this is just what she wants the public to know, um, is, is only on, available as part of that original dust jacket. So when we thought, think about author's intentions, one of the problems we have is that we don't oft, always know who the author is. Um, this is a book, it's not in the collection, but I had to include it here because it's such a great example of something. This is the home, uh, Priscilla Homespun's Universal Receipt Book of 1818, and you have to kind of wonder whether Priscilla Homespun is a real name. <laughs> it's not. Because the 1816 first edition of this book was printed and the author was listed as, quote, a society of gentlemen in New York. <laughs> and it failed to sell. <laughs> so it was, uh, they decided to reissue the book uh, with a new author and the author was named Priscilla Homespun and it became a popular cookbook. Um, these are these issues of, of uh, pseudonyms uh, are, are fairly common in the early 19th century in particular. Um, sometimes uh, authors were trying to hide their identities, other times they were trying to use something that would be more attractive, like the name Priscilla Homespun. And sometimes they were hiding it because they stole the whole book. Um, this is uh, this is a book which is not in the collection, but there's another, there's another edition of the same text. This is uh, Lucy Emerson, and I, it's uh, the, New, the New England Cookery of 1808. It's the first, book, first cookbook published in the state of Vermont, uh, but it's not Lucy Emerson's, despite the fact that her introduction says that she uh, uh, went to great pains to be original. It is almost word for word stolen from Amelia Simmons. Uh, and Amelia Simmons' American Cookery, which we'll talk about in a second, was one of the, was, was, is widely considered, and I, th I think pretty definitively, the first American cookbook by an American author. And the reason I put it in that formulation is that there were books printed prior to Amelia Simmons uh, in America that were cookbooks, but they were all English cookbooks that were just being reprinted in New York or Boston or Philadelphia. And that went on for almost 50 years, or, or 50 years exactly, um, 54 years, sorry, before an American author created a book, a cookbook. So this little book, um, and I, I think it's important to take a look, a look at it physically, it's actually a very tiny book, it's about that big, it's about five inches tall. Um, it is, it is uh, in, scale, in a scale board binding. If you look at the very top right-hand corner of the book, you can see a little bit of the wood sticking out. And that's because uh, these sort of wood, like sort of almost like shingle scraps, were used for boards for book, books. It's got um, a leather back. And if you look very carefully, You can see that it's, it's, the book is sewn on tapes. That's how they hold the covers onto the, the, uh, the groups of pages. But what's in, why I, I bother pointing those tapes out, they're little leather uh, straps. And you'll notice that they aren't even the same size or shape. That, that this is entirely a handmade book. Um, these, these books, all, all of the editions of Amelia Simmons, including this one, uh, were issued in small cities and towns in New England. There sadly was not a main imprint, which is really a shame. But there, was, there were two New Hampshire imprints. Um, this one was, again, uh, Vermont, and it doesn't have Amelia's name on it. But every part of this book is handmade. 
And this is very much uh, the case with almost all of the early American cookbooks. This is, this is an actual copy of Amelia Simmons. This is the Walpole, New Hampshire edition of 1812. And you can see the same sort of thing. It's got a decorated paper over scale board. Here the board is much more revealed because the, the, the paper is worn away with a leather spine. And when you think about leather and you look at a leather book, you have to remember that leather was easier to find in a small town in America than cloth. It was much, you know, you always, there people were, were creating leather, or you could create leather, you know, starting in any butcher shop. So you had the raw materials. You didn't have appropriate book cloth. And I talked a little bit about who, about this book being printed in small places, about it being handmade, about it being very small. But it's also very humble in terms of the author's intention, because we talked about the author's intention a minute ago. The, Amelia Simmons describes herself as an American orphan and the intended audience for the book being American orphans. Now, there's some discussion of who she means when she says American orphans. Is, is that sort of a wider term for young American women? Um, whether or not that's true, it, what is clear is that the book was intended for people who were learning to become household servants, and they were going to be living for the most part, working for the most part, in fairly humble households. And so they needed these simple recipes because this would be a set of skills that they didn't already have that would help them get a job. The reason that I really, this is, I, I stuck in a slide that's totally not representative of of, of the Kramer collection here at Bowdoin, purely for comparison purposes. So this is Amelia Simmons, American Cookery, 1812. This is what's going on in France at roughly the same time. Th this book is a little earlier than it should be, but it, it makes the point so well. Uh, this is Vincent LaChapelle's Cuisinier Moderne. Um, it was one of the grand books of the 18th century, French cookbooks of the 18th century. Uh, this particular edition, the third most complete edition, uh, was five volumes filled with these beautiful, elaborate folding plates. This is actually one of the smaller plates. Uh, there's an engraving in the same volume that is nine feet long, which shows the, the, the table setting for a royal meal. And you don't have to know anything about what is inside this book, except maybe one of those plates, to know that this is entirely a different type of cookbook than what we just looked at. The, the type, the person cooking, the person, the person who owned the book, the person who managed the people cooking, the people cooking were all different people in this book, not the case with the American book we just saw. The number of people dining would be as up to 100 people if you were to look at that one very, very large plate. Not to mention that the book itself has this very fine binding. It's, a, um, it's not quite a tree calf binding, but it's got, it's a, a decorated binding. The book itself is a very handsome object, not like the book we were just looking at. I'll go back one slide so you can see that. Pretty different. This book, by the way, has these weird lines on it because the owner who is here in Maine, this book lived in Maine for about 100 years, which is nice. Uh, uh, thought it was a really important book, and they wrapped the book in black electrical tape in the 1950s. <laughs> and and a, a, a restoration binder here in, in Maine uh, spent several weeks removing that. So we're going to keep, keep talking about bindings a little bit. This is, um, this is a grouping of some of the earliest American cookbooks in the Kramer collection. These are all, everything you're going to see in the next bunch of slides are from the Kramer collection. So these books are all in um, leather bindings. Uh, most of them are, are bound, even the books that are in later bindings, they were originally issued in leather binding, bindings. Um, they were all um, a certain size. Almost all of these books are duodecimos, which is, uh, be, you know, between four and six inches. There's a more technical definition of what that means that I don't want to get into. But um, they're small, they're fully leather bound, they're mostly handmade. The one on the very left is actually, was bound in America, but it's in an Irish style binding, which is kind of interesting. And that is a book which is in the exhi exhibition. Um, that is one of the books that preceded the, um, 
That's the 1772 edition of Susanna Carter, and that preceded Amelia Simmons' book by 24 years. And the reason that book is such a, a wonderful book, even though it's an English cookbook printed in America, is that the, the two engravings, which are carving instructions, were engraved by Paul Revere. So here's another set of bindings. This is the period just following what we saw. These books tend to be a little bit thinner. Uh, they're a little bit more uniform. Uh, the word housekeeper is in almost all of the titles of these books, which is interesting. But what they've decided is that they can decorate the cover of the book. But how do you do it? Well, you print a piece of paper, and then you wrap it around the cover of the book. So this was, this was a change of marketing style from, from this and of production. Most of the books in this grouping were produced by larger publishers in bigger cities, whereas the, the previous ones were not. It was a kind of a mix all over the, the eastern seaboard. And following that, we have another technological advance in printing and binding, which reflects itself physically in the books. This is the 1830s, 20s and 30s. All of these books have these highly decorated spines where often they'll, they'll put a list of what you find inside the book. Uh, oh, it's got soups, fish, meat, vegetables. There's nothing on the front covers of these books or the back covers. These, all of the decoration, which now can be done, they've, they've had enough technological advance that this is now being done by, uh, it's, not, it's a sort of quasi-machine, quasi-hand process. But... So they've made an advance technically, but there's also this marketing thing going on, and it tells you how these books live at the store when you go to buy them. You'd go to the general store, and they'd be like that on the shelf. So you could see exactly what was inside the books. So you go another two decades forward, and things have gotten a lot broader. Um, you have color variation in the bindings. You can see now that they're stamping on the front and the sides of the book. You can see that the stamping and the decoration occurs in, in, uh, in, in gilt or gold as well as black and other colors. The Diet for the Sick, the third book in from the left, I think the front cover that has four, is four color stamping. And this is very expensive, but it's because as the American middle class starts to grow, they start to give books as gifts, which is something we still do with cookbooks, is we, we like to give them as gifts. And the nicest thing you can, uh, if you want to make your book more uh, giveable as a gift, you make it more attractive. Although I'm not sure I would give diet for the sick as a gift. <laughs> I don't know. Another decade or two later, Americans are hungry for color printing because color printing is starting to become something that they're more and more familiar with. There's always been color printing or, or color illustration in books. But at this, this is the era here in the 1880s and 90s of, um, of the chromolithograph where trade cards and, other, and postcards and other things were starting to have these really beautiful color illustrations. So they go back to the technique that we used, you know, five decades ago and print something on paper and then wrap it around the boards, but now they're printing in multi -co multiple colors. And there, there are loads of examples of these uh, within the collection, and all of these are part of the collection. I love the DeWitt's Connecticut cookbook. That's the third one in from the left, and there's just this family sitting down for dinner, and they just don't look happy about what they're eating at all. <laughs> so... So this is, this is sort of all the stuff that happens up to the point where the book is issued. This is like, you know, the, the author writes a book, they have an idea, they write the book, the, the, the publisher and the binder they get together and they do, you know, the typography and the illustration and the binding. But then it moves on to book selling. This is a book that's not in the collection, but this is such a marvelous example of this really strange thing uh, that I, I have to include this in almost every talk I ever give. Um, this is the very first American, this is the very first cocktail book. This is Jerry Thomas's uh, Bon Vivant's Companion or The Bartender's Guide. It has different titles depending on who you're talking with. And you can see it, there's a picture right there of, uh, 
uh, a, a miscellaneous drinker, that's not Jerry Thomas, uh, and it says price $1.50. That price is what determines uh, what the first edition of this book is. And that was a, this is a particularly fine copy of this book. But the reason it's really special and the reason that it's important to pay attention to individual copies of books and not just the text is this little thing here. This is a bookseller's ticket. And a bookseller's ticket, you find them in, in books in, from all different uh, nations, including American, and they were pretty common right up through the 1950s. Um, and there are some people who still use them. I, I really love them. Um, and it basically is a little thing that would tell you where, where this book was sold. And this one was sold in Havana, Cuba. And the reason this is interesting is two, two things. Number one, cocktails in Cuba are intimately tied together, and people are always trying to look back and see what the, what the origin of these, uh, uh, you know, when did certain cocktails start there. This little bookseller's ticket tells you the name of the bookseller and the street it was on. And if you go back and you look at historical city directories for Havana in the 19th century, this has been isolated to the late 1870s and the early 1880s. So we know that this copy of an American cocktail book was actually sold in Cuba in the 1870s and 1880s, or somewhere in that time frame. So it actually kind of goes, it pushes the whole idea of cocktails, at least having American-style cocktails, making some sort of foray into Cuba back by about three decades. So it's a tiny little ephemeral piece of, a, of a, an otherwise really fabulous book, but this little tiny clue is the part that's really important for you know, understanding at least that one piece of history of uh, cocktails in Cuba. So at this point, the book has entered the world. It's out there being sold by a bookseller. It's not just an idea or a, a book that comes straight out of the, of the publisher's warehouse. And so at this point, we want to start to look to evidence of use. And this is sort of, to me, the second big story that gets told. You know, the first story was all about what the author and the other people creating the book, uh, what do they leave behind for us to look at and discover when we're, we're trying to look at some, a, a cookbook historically. Once the book is out there in the world, there's a whole new set of information and a whole new set of stories that the book tells. And one thing that's really cool is that often the, mo the more used and beaten up a book gets, the more story it can tell, um, which is not something that booksellers traditionally look at. They often want the nicest, happiest, shiniest copy. Um, not me. Um, this is a side view of a book that's really only about 30 pages long, but it's been stuffed filled uh, full of, of other things. Almost all of those little folded things inside are actually recipe sheets from a cooperative extension. Um, so somebody was going and taking cooperative extension classes, and they just kept adding it to their little handwritten cookbook. And so that, I just think that's a great piece of evidence of use. So one of the big pieces, one of the big examples of evidence of use is repair. Um, and you know, it's, it's, you can look at a book and say, so uh, it was repaired. So what? But this was a, a book. We'll see another picture of it a little bit later. And this book was. Uh, in a kitchen of a Philadelphia area, area confectioner. Um, and the whole thing was covered with something that's kind of like black electrical tape, but it's not. It's a type of tape we see in the late 19th century. It's actually a French uh, confiseur manual, but it lived in, in uh, Pennsylvania for over 100 years, and it got a lot of use. And you know, there's, I don't want to guess that that's flour ground into the cover and whatnot, but you can see that this was a book that had a real life in a professional kitchen. This is another type of repair when the book needs to be basically rebound. And so we see this whole style of thing that's, that's now being called vernacular binding. Um, it's a term I really love, which is basically somebody at home uh, takes the book and gives it a whole new structure. This is a book that was held together with brass brads and uh, over canvas, and then they had these nice ties. These are linen ties that were sewn onto the book, so you could tie it up with a, a big bow. And this was done after the original boards had fallen off. So this is actually a repair. This is another repair. It's a little hard to see it, but it's a stab sewn binding where somebody's taken a piece of, of uh, oil cloth, uh, which is a little bit resistant to water and grease, and they've stabbed holes in it with an awl and then sewn through it. It's kind of a very, it's kind of like a Japanese binding style, but very primitive. 
This is, uh, this is one that was done in advance. This is uh, a book that belonged to uh, the famous food writer, uh, New England illustrator Samuel Chamberlain, who was one of the founders of uh, Gourmet Magazine. And he took all of his books when he bought them, and he covered them in these decorative French papers. And then he put these tiny little handwritten labels on them all. So he did this as a, as a, uh, in advance of his using them. And there's a whole wall of books like this at the Schlesinger Library. Um, but it's an interesting, you know, it's a very sort of particular, affected type of protection. Um, this is a, another cookbook which has been uh, covered in advance. It was a brand new book when it was covered. Uh, it was covered with linen. And the reason I like to show this is this is the inside. And after folding it and carefully securing it with steel pins, they also taped a piece of linen ribbon to hold the book together. And one of the reasons I think that this kind of stuff is really important when you're looking at cookbooks is that people didn't do this to lots of other types of books. The, the cookbooks had a particular role that they wanted them to, to be able to be in the kitchen, they wanted to be able to use them, they knew that they were going to get beaten up, so they're trying to protect them or they're trying to put them back together after they've been damaged. But you don't see very many vernacular bindings on, on books in other categories. There are some other categories um, where you see them. And frankly, you, you know, this is where you realize cookbooks are closer to auto repair manuals than they are to, to novels. It doesn't sound very sexy when you talk about cookbooks that way, but I think it's true in terms of how they, the role they had. And here's one, one last vernacular binding. This is also brown linen uh, over, over uh, paper boards, and they've, they've gone back and forth with the thread to sew that thing together. And, and the, the, the last point I want to make about this type of binding is that this is another place in the house where craft is being done. In other words, the, the cookbook is, a, is a, a useful book that has to do with a type of craft in the household, which is cooking. Here you have another piece of household craft showing up on the books themselves. Um, basic, you know, uh, sewing and, and uses of fiber. So another thing you find in terms of evidence of use is these sort of navigation systems in cookbooks. Um, some have printed navigation systems. We're all used to table of contents and indexes, which are really fabulous things to study when you start to look at cookbooks because it's a really quick way to see what the ingredients are. How far down do they break the ingredients? This one is not far down at all, but they've actually, someone has added a few extra things into this book. Said, well, we're going to add the breakfast dishes here and savories with the entrees. And not only do we have meats, game, and poultry, but we have curries. So the, the person is added to the, the way one navigates the book. You can also find, oh, well now, what every, everybody does, they put post-its in their book. And that's the same thing. It's a form of navigation. How do you find your way back to the recipe you wanted? This is a much more, this is the same thing. It's just extremely elaborate. This is, this is a, a manuscript cookbook uh, from a, a cook to the king and kaiser. Um, Adolf Hooster was the cook's name, and he was uh, um, to cook to, to Kaiser Wilhelm. And this, he gave his business to one of his cooks. And when he gave the business, he gave a set of recipes in this huge manuscript cookbook that was entirely handwritten. He paid a secretary to write this thing out. It's 1,400 very lengthy recipes, and it's got something like 73 pages of index that look just like this. So that's, this is page 21 through 23. Um, every page is just as detailed and just as carefully handwritten. Um, and within the pages, if you flip through the rec regular recipes themselves, you'll see in, the, in the, the borders little things written in which refer to other recipes. And he's telling you where to go for recipes to go together. So he's actually got this sort of like hypertext conversation going on. So continuing with evidence of use, I, I don't know how many people here um, will cross out a recipe if they really hate it or write no. Um, and there's a wonderful example of, of criticism that I, I don't have a picture of. It's a book I no longer own, and I don't know how to get a picture of it. 
um, but it was it was a book that had some medicinal recipes in along with the uh, along with the, the the culinary recipes, and it was a, a recipe for eyewash. And the person had scratched the whole thing out and wrote no in giant letters in the <laughs> margin. And this is actually really similar. This is somebody has taken, this is the preface of this book. Um, I'll tell you about it in a second. And they've completely obliterated the lettering on the left side. And then they've completely obliterated the lettering on the right. And then, and you can't really tell here, they've pasted a piece of paper down over the obliteration. <laughs> so, so this book is a book that's called the... Uh, Delbert Modern, it's the, or the Modern Albert, and it's a book of household and culinary recipes from uh, 18th century France. It's a pretty common book. It's not, it's not that rare. And it's got lots of stuff like how do you make toothpaste and uh, hair tonic and stuff to make your horse healthy. And I mean, it's a, sta a standard household book. It goes back and forth between food and drink and medical and, and useful stuff. And he, the author, who's anonymous on this edition, says, well, I named it The Modern Albert because of the, the famous books uh, w which were called Big and Little Albert, or Grand Albert and Petit Albert, that were issued by this Swabian alchemist in the 14th century or 15th century. And everybody knows those books he, because the guy was a charlatan. And he was a, I'm not saying every, I'm saying he's talking to his audience. Everybody knows who Albert of Swabia is. And, um, and he basically says, I'm calling my book Modern Albert because my recipes work. They're not like Grand Albert and Little Albert, and, whose recipes were ridiculously stupid. And then he says, can you believe that people thought this would work? And that's the part that he obliterates. And what it is, is a Kabbalistic recipe that includes the mention of a number of clearly non-Christian gods, and a number of sex acts. And his point is, this is a ridiculously stupid recipe. My recipes work. But the owner of this book said, I don't want this witchcraft in my house. And if you go and you look, there's a, the Index pro, uh, Prohibitorum, um, which is a now thankfully gone... Uh, uh, thing that we used to be issued by the Catholic Church of books that were prohibited. There was a second index of books that were okay if you cut out certain portions of it, and this was the portion for this book that needed to be excised. So when you get beyond taking stuff out, you get putting stuff in, and we all do that too. If we have cookbooks, we have things we've printed out from the internet that we stuck into other cookbooks, right? Um, and, or things we've cut out of newspapers that we particularly like. And people have been doing this for forever. I mean, as long as there have been cookbooks, they've become easy rep receptacles for other recipes. So we have recipes that are, that are pasted into the backs of books like this. And we got somebody who got really excited and pasted a lot of things into this little book. This is actually a, a little, like a, a, an almanac sort of book that was put out by a paint and varnish company. And said, they said, you know, once the year was done, there was nothing useful for the almanac, so it's a useful book to paste other stuff in. Um, this is a single little newspaper clipping. Doesn't look all that exciting, but the cool thing about this is that that's the back of that page, and it, the, the newspaper clipping was sewn in with, with silk thread. Um, people would pin them in with steel pins. They'd sew them in. They'd paste them in. Uh, there, I've seen one very elaborate one where the clippings would all lay over each other so you could open them up like a kind of a puzzle book. Um, and, uh, and, you know, other times people would just stuff them into the book like that first image we saw. So we're getting sort of towards the, the general end of, of this, but the, I, I want to talk about ownership and succession because that's part of what happens with a cookbook after it's gone out into the world is it has a series of owners. You know, we, at the very beginning, I mentioned that um, books are given as gifts, and people give, they don't only give uh, cookbooks as new books, or new cookbooks as gifts, they often give uh, older ones. This is um, not a gift, though. This is that uh, French confiseur manual I mentioned to you that lived in Philadelphia. And you can see up on the, on the upper left-hand corner, it says Philadelphia 18, oh, 26 or 76, I can't read it from here. 
Uh, and the guy's name was Eugene Dietrich, and we've actually tracked him down thanks to Google Scholar. And we know a little bit about his, his uh, pastry shop in, in Philadelphia. And he was using this French manual there. And that's also another bookseller's ticket, uh, by the way, on the bottom. This book was originally sold um, in, uh, was that in Geneva? Well, a French-speaking country. That's all I can read from here. And this, is, this is another example of ownership and succession. This is uh, Lettuce Arnold. Or Le we think of it as Letitia is the name, but if we think lettuce is odd, or Letty. Arnold, her book given by the lady, uh, again, Letitia G. So it was, it was two Letitias, Arnold, it was given by Lady G to Lady Arnold, um, and dated 1638. This was a very large, late Elizabethan manuscript cookbook, um, which we, we sold a couple of years ago. And the interesting thing about it is that it, it gives the whole succession of who owned the book in, in the book itself. And it starts out as a, a gift book. But even here, this isn't the beginning of the book. This is the first time it's given. So Lady Lettuce G gives this as a gift to Lettuce Arnold, probably on the occasion of her marriage. But Lady G is not giving her book She's having it copied and then given. So the recipes themselves really reflect like a generation or two generations older than the, the, the creation of this book. Um, facing that page is this page, which mentions two different houses. So these are the two houses that this book lived at um, and a number of owners. And it was very common that people would like write their name multiple times because just, it just felt good. And Anne Colt was one of the later owners. This book lived in the second house, which was the Munderfield house, um, which was in Wales. Um, this is the oldest known cookbook from Wales, although it's in English because it's an aristocratic book. Um, and it lived at Munderfield house until after World War I. And the interesting thing about it is that it, during World War I, the owner at that time recorded the recipes of the village people folk that were used as remedies during the war. So the folks who owned this still saw it as a useful living book. It was not just some family artifact that had to be kept, but something that still was this container of information that could be added to. And I think it's pretty amazing that a book could start in the 1630s and still be added to in, in 1914, 15, 16. So, I'm just going to close up with a couple thoughts. I'm sorry that I'm in this photo because you've seen enough of me already, but this is the only really good photograph I have of the collection in one location when it was on the wall behind my desk. Uh, so, everything you see above the ledge, including the books on their side, were part of this collection. Um, and it was in chronological order. So, the third story I just want to tell about. You know, the first story was the author. The second story was the user after the books entered the world. And the third one, briefly, is just of the collector. If a book is fortunate enough to make it through a long life and end up in the hands of a collector, there are things that get discovered and stories that can get are revealed that one otherwise not, might not be seen. And I have had the pleasure of handling a lot of these individual titles over the years, but I'd certainly never had this many of them all at once in one place. And we put them in chronological order on the wall. And if you look sort of over my left shoulder, you can see uh, at shoulder height on the far left, you see all these little white tabs on that shelf? Each one of those white tabs was a decade. So you can start to see that it starts in the 1770s and there's like one book. And then the 1780s, there's one book. And then there's uh, 1800, there's two books. And then it gets to 1820 and there are 15 books. And then there are 40. And it goes on like that. Until the, the collection stops in about 1910, although there are a handful of very important books that are included after that. But, but 1910, there are like 150 books or something. For that, for that decade. And, and, I, and I'm sure that there are hundreds of more beyond that. 
and so you get this idea that the, the, the cookbooks have, ex, you know, the pace of the publishing of cookbooks just expands and expands and expands, and it's still expanding now. It's ridiculous how many cookbooks are published each year. So you get this, you get that. The second thing you can start to see when you look at this wall is how the books start out tiny, and then they get very sort of consistent. They're all like roughly the same size and roughly the same thickness. And if you were to look really closely, you'd see that the titles basically all reflect books that are like an omnibus, one-size-fits-all book. Like this is the one book you need. It's got fish and meats and soups and cakes. This is it. But as you go further, you start to see all this variation in sizes. And if you were to be able to look at the titles, you'd start to see the variations in this, the topics of the book. So you'd see single subject books, books that are just about cake or bread or eggs. You'd see appliance books that were just about the chafing dish. You know, they, the, the 1890s is this explosion of chafing dish books, which is represented in the collection in the library. You, you see there's a whole little section of them. And that's because people started living in apartment buildings. And they needed, they, there were no kitchens in apartment buildings in the 1890s you had to go to a cafeteria down the street or something like a cafeteria, or you could get a chafing dish. So there was a need for these books. You also see, and there are a couple of really big, thick, tall books that show up on the shelf there, sort of as you start to move this way. Those are professional chef books. And the, you know, the professional chef books, the ego starts on day one. It's just like today. <laughs> the other thing that happens that you only really see when you put this, this collection together, or, or a big collection of books together and start to look at them carefully, is you notice the difference of the publisher. So instead of just people who were publishers, you had novelty publishers. You had every magazine, the women's magazines, which started to exist in the 1880s, 1890s. They were all putting out books. Department stores were publishing books. Companies that made sewing machines and sewing patterns were putting out books. Anything that might out overlap with women's work. There's also the professional books, the chef books, all of that. And there are series, because it's no longer good enough to sell a, book, a, a person one book when you could divide the book up into nine little parts and sell them one book on egg and one book on fish and one book on meat, etc. So I just want to say in closing that we, like we, we, put, we can pick up a book, and it could be at home, it could be if we're visiting the Kramer Collection here at Bowdoin, and our first inclination might be to flip to the recipes and to try to find something delicious, and that's kind of, actually, that's probably the best reason to pick up a cookbook. But if you look beyond the recipes, I hope you've seen some examples of this, you can find types of historical information, types of stories, types of evidence of, of what was going on uh, in whatever century the book is from, whatever decade, um, and we can start to listen to those stories in a, in a, uh, in a deeper way than if we're just sat, you know, satisfied to look at the recipes. So thank you. Um, and I'm, I, I, we're all set up to take two questions. You think that's good? Okay. I'm sorry it's going to be short, short on the questions because I talk too much. Um, anybody? There's one up there. Or who, whoever you get to, Kat. Hi, Don. It's uh, Barton Siever. Yeah, hi, Barton. Uh, nice seeing you. <laughs> Good and, to see you. Uh, thank Thanks you to Bowdoin, uh, to Crammers, and to you for bringing this to our community. This is, this is excellent. Uh, I'm doing some research myself right now on uh, some stuff, and, and you've mentioned the sexes through, throughout this. And, mm -hmm. and I've seen some very sort of stark disparity between professional books, which tend to be written in a very masculine tone, uh, and some really un unfortunate and laughably sort of in this generation, inappropriate things written uh, instructionally to women hmm? uh, in books. When do you see and how have you seen changes in the subtle and very overt sexism uh, in books uh, as culinary has become more of a, a mainstream item? 
Um, it's a really good question, and, and I, I think I'll only have a partial answer, and a uh, very partial answer. Um, I, I, think, I think you're totally right. I think that there are, uh, uh, it, and it has a lot to do with who it is that's assembling the book and who the audience is for. I think you see, like, you, I think there's very little sexism if you look at church and charitable books, because those are books assembled by women for women. And they know what, they know what their audience needs in order to cook those things. To us, it might be a bit of a mystery when we look at one of those recipes, but those, those cooks knew what they needed. Um, there, if, you look at, if you were to take a really long view back through cookbook publishing, going all the way back to you know, the, the, the 15th century and then looking forward, you get this long stretch of books that are purely professional books. And then you start in the French books, you start to see books that include uh, home cooking. But those books are for professionals because somebody discovered that home cooking was good and it should be, that there were dishes being made in French homes that should be included in those professional books, which is an interesting thing. You think that when you first pick up the books, you think, oh, home, home books. No, these are professional books aimed at men working in, you know, professionally in kitchens, but they were drawing their recipes from women. Um, I think that there's... Uh, there's an interesting thing that happens with cookbooks, which I didn't talk about because it's, it's, it's a tough one, that cookbooks, cookbooks can be, there's this, this sort of dichotomy with cookbooks. They can be prescriptive, or they can be descriptive, or they can be somewhere on the timeline between those two. And what that means is that they can be descriptive of something. See, they're either looking backward, here's something that happened, and I'm going to show you what it was, or they can be prescriptive, here's a set of instructions to make something in the future. And most cookbooks are some blend of those two, but I think that most of the, um, I think that mo a lot of the sexism in cookbooks has to do with that clash of descriptive versus prescriptive, and the fact that a lot of the men's books, the professional books, are descriptive. Here's something that happened in the past. This is especially true of fancy restaurant books. And it's one of the reasons there's always this big debate about amongst cooks. Like, are, are, are fancy restaurant books just stupid? I mean, you, hear, you see that all the time on the, on the internet. People are dissing restaurant books. But the, the, purpose is, the, the purpose of those books is often entirely different from the purpose of, uh, say, on the opposite side of the scale, um, easy cooking one, two, three. Like, that's a purely prescriptive book. Like, here's how you do this, it's going to work. And, and so, if you look at these books when these questions of sexism come up, or, or if you look at books through that lens, I think it starts to illuminate that issue. There's one other thing that I'll mention. I started, because I think that the sexism in cookbooks issue is huge and really interesting, and I don't think there's been enough work done on it, because frankly, I think cookbooks are still like a wide open field, but in terms of historical research. But the, um, I started looking at the way in the cookbooks women describe going to market and the way men describe going to market. And, and I, I, the thing that struck me, and I, I'm, this is still way too early for this to be, <laughs> for me to say this com with complete uh, faith in it, but my impression is that women go to discern Men go. This is the, this is not what I'm. This is what's being described in the books. But women go to discern. How do they get something for the best price? How do they get the freshest of this or the best of that? Men go on a hunt, and it's all. It becomes this whole thing about this like elaborate journey that the men are going on in order to discover this somewhat exotic, which often isn't exotic at all, <laughs> thing. Um, and I think I think that that would be. I, I'm, that's, I'm going to continue to look at that every time I look at a cookbook, is how do they describe going to market, men versus women? So. One more? Down here? Oh. Hi. Um, I was really interested in this expansion of cookbooks in the, was it the 19th century? Yeah, it, it, well, I mean, the, this collection covers basically right. the first 130 years of American right. cookery. Right. And the, the, one of the reasons that, that Cliff, who, who assembled the collection, 
stopped in about 1910 is that he realized that there were way too many books after 1910. That's the yeah. first thing. And secondly, and this is something that, that really is only after we looked at it on the wall for a long enough time, almost every category of cookbook that we would recognize today you know, book, books that are all about one ingredient or books that are about everything minus one ingredient, mm -hmm. like gluten-free cooking, right. um, that all of those things, paleo, raw food, nutritional cooking, economical cooking, um, you know, cooking for bachelors, it's all, it, it all happened in 19th century in America at one point. It doesn't mean that the books, that it's all been done. The office and the purposes are different. So that's one thing is that we saw the explosion already happen. The second thing is that the explosion happened for a reason. Well, and that's what I'm really yeah. interested in. Is I, I mean, I can think of two possibilities here. One is that literacy, mm -hmm. and the other is discontinuity between the lives of mothers and daughters so that you don't get as much learning through apprenticeship. And mm -hmm. I wondered about the relative importance of those and what other reasons that you had. I, I wouldn't want to have to rank these things, but you'd also have to add the, the, uh, the massive, you know, the rapidly growing middle class in America, that, that, and this was happening in Europe as well. Um, so, so that the, the middle class, you know, the cookbooks were for a long time about the upper classes. And then they were maybe about the lower classes because people needed to train, and there are a lot of books like this, we're going to teach you poor people how to cook so you can take care of yourself. And we hope that you're going to walk away from all of your food traditions that you brought over when you came from that Italy. Um, and, and now you'll cook good English-style American food. It's, so, but, so that happens. But so cookbooks were like for the top and for the bottom at certain moments. But then the middle, it, then, you know, everything in the middle is aspirational. So the, 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 the young woman in the town has to, um, she, she marries the banker's son, and she needs to know how to entertain in a different style than she did before she married the banker's son. So here's a book that will teach her how to do that, how to set the table properly, how to do all of that. So, I, so that's another one. And then there's also the technological expansion in printing. Just a huge explosion of, you know, of, of what was going on, how many books were published in all fields, and, and the distribution networks of those books, and and uh, the amount of money to be made. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. My thanks to Don for his wonderful talk. Please join us over in the exhibition gallery on the second floor of Hawthorne Longfellow Library where you'll uh, have a chance to sample some of the recipes from several of the cookbooks prepared by Bone and Dining. So thank you very much. <laughs>